Okay, hi everyone. I seem to be doing a lot of live streaming today. Um, we have another discussion here about sort of an exploratory discussion about molecular computing. Um, and uh, um, here's the question. If you're going to do information processing with molecules, what's the right way to do that? And the one answer to that is, you know, in other words, so in a sense, uh, you know, what is the data structure um, that in which you store information? So for a very basic question, if we're doing, you know, information processing or computation with molecules, um, you know, how, you know, what's the data structure um, to store information and that may not even really necessarily mean anything because um, uh, the it could be that the journey is the story so to speak that is that the process of getting to an output the process of, of chemical you know the sequence of chemical reactions could actually be the thing that represents what is going on in the computation. So one possibility is you make a particular molecule. Another possibility is you have a certain distribution um, of molecular concentrations. And the more exotic case would be uh, there is a, um, a kind of a multi-way graph of um, different uh, um, um, the um, um, possible transformations yeah 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 um, and and um, sorry I'm just trying to organize something here um One second. Um, anyway, so, so, uh, right. So my question would be in traditional chemistry or things, I mean, you know, when you think of chemistry as information processing, are there any other sort of places? I mean, like, like, you know, you have a signaling pathway, for example. Um, that's essentially, that's the most common case where you're sort of representing, is that the right thing? Is that the right way to think about it? Or is that not the right way to think about it? Um, that's certainly one way to think about it. I mean, uh, in biology, signaling networks are very important for passing information, for example, from outside the cell to inside the cell, from the cytoplasm to the nucleus and things like that. Uh, yeah, but if, if, we, if we look at what's going on in a cell, okay, so the, the, you know, how do we characterize, you know, quotes, what's going on in a cell? And, and the answer tends to be, We've got things like transcription starts up for some particular uh, protein and things like this. And that's, I mean, in yeah, a I sense, just, that, that's in you make a particular molecule. That's one type of thing that can happen. Right. And, and in the cell, the way it, the, the state is typically characterized these days, it, it's basically by how much protein expression, you know, how, how much of the various proteins have been expressed at, over time. That's how those how change. Much, yeah, right, right. So that's, you know, it's like uh, looking at how much now, I don't know whether, I mean, there are presumably other things that happen, like proteins combine, and I'm not sure how much that is part of the characterization of what's going on. I mean, clearly, there are cases where, I don't know, proteins will will sort of arrange themselves to make, I don't know, I don't know what, like insulin, I think makes itself from, you know, from putting together a cluster of 
of different subunits and things. I believe well, you're talking about the quaternary structure of the protein there. Yes. Yes. That, the, you know, that would be that, um, not for insulin, but things like hemoglobin where there are multiple chains, but there are, are uh, proteins often interact within uh, the cell uh, forming conjugates that then either become catalytic and do something a particular way, or they, they uh, initiate a signaling event. Uh, proteins interact with receptors uh, both uh, on the, uh, within the cell uh, of the cell cytoplasm or the uh, cell membrane both intracellularly and uh, extracellularly to, to do that. So the protein interactions, what they call the interactome uh, right. is very important uh, for uh, conveying information. We don't understand a lot of it though. Okay, but, but my question is, in that interactome, the basic data structure ends up being, you've got all these different possible proteins that can get expressed or not expressed or whatever else, genes that can get expressed and not expressed. And you're essentially, if you say, what is the current state of the cell? You would be able to characterize, I mean, okay, the, 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 the state of the cell must depend on, you know, concentrations of things and also some spatial information. I mean, it doesn't usually, one doesn't usually like, is this thing sitting in the, you know, in the Golgi apparatus or something like this, right? Or, or pores on the cell surface. I mean, you, you just say, I mean, usually it's just the concentration. It's just, it has this number of, of um, this kind of, you know, uh, whatever they are, CD8 things on a T cell or whatever else it is. Right. Is yeah. Correct. It's yeah. really mostly concentrations. As far as we know right now, it's mostly not spatial information. Right, and that generally has to do with the way it's measured. They, uh, with green fluorescent dye tagging and things like that, you can, and microscopy, you can start localizing uh, where they are. Uh, but I don't know if anybody has quantitative ways of, of measuring that over time. Well, I, I remember uh, that. And, like, and then you need a coordinate yeah. frame as well. Right. I remember so from speak. millions of years ago, people talking about, you know, detailed morphology of the spatial information in microtubules, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, spatial cellular automata running, uh, you know, CAs running in, um, uh, in microtubules, those kinds of things. And I mean, people talk about, you know, again, for nerve cells, there's the whole question of, you know, does it matter uh, you know, uh, is there a lot of detailed processing in the in the whole dendritic, uh, you know, in, in the set of dendritic in the dendritic tree, or is it just this overall excitation, or or, or what? But mm -hmm. I think the the question really. So what we what we're saying is, in traditional chemistry, it's mostly a story of chemical concentrations, and it's mostly one is imagining mostly, and in some sense, it's like everything is fluid. There's not a solid, you know, the only thing with the spatial information is on the genome where it is essentially string matching that is determining, you know, so the, the spatial information, um, you know, that there's, uh, there's, there's sort of coordinates by string matching, which is the genome case. Well, by string matching, which is either genome or you know, docking into active sites and things like this, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, but even then docking into active sites depends on where the receptor uh, or the, the enzyme are located. Bob, doesn't chemical potential come into play here besides concentration? Which I, I guess you could say that, but um, I'm not sure what you, uh, you know, how you would characterize chemical potential in an enzyme reaction. I thought chemical potential, so um, it, uh, um, well, okay, so remind me, chemical potential in the usual Boltzmann distribution, you have e to the minus beta h by beta e plus mu times the number density, is that right? Isn't that a concentration? Isn't that just a way of representing concentration in the canonical ensemble? 
Uh, my stat mech's a bit rusty. Uh, we always, I always thought about it in the uh, courses that I taught that it was um, Gibbs energy divided by the change in the number of particles or you know, amount of moles. And then of course you can take that and divide it by the volume and get a mole. Uh, a concentration. Yeah. I think it, it's equivalent to concentration, isn't it? I mean, am I, am I very confused? Yeah, but when you start talking about concentration at the molecular or atomic scale rather than uh, in bulk, I think mm -hmm. you know, it's, oh, I, it's, I think it's a different game. No, no, uh, but, yeah. but the point is this. It's just like temperature, right? Temperature at the microscopic level, you know, the Boltzmann distribution is what links macroscopic temperature with microscopic right. information. Okay. I'm pretty sure chemical potential is what links macroscopic number density or macroscopic concentration with microscopic you know it's, it's asking what's the probability that you have that you're occupying this microscopic state oh it's an exponential distribution that depends on the energy it depends on the chemical potential etc it depends on temperature and chemical potential temperature is the thing conjugate to energy chemical potential i think is the thing concentrate conjugate to number density if i'm not mistaken yes, um, maybe that somebody out right. The, okay, but so so this is that, but there's also potentially, I don't know whether there are other kinds of coordinates used in, in, in biology. There are other ways of getting coordinates, so to speak. Don't know. Um, I mean, I, I feel like in clearly, well, yes, I mean, okay, another, another form is e.g. in dendritic, in, in um, uh, not branchial trees, but bronchial trees, um, you know, or dendritic spines or whatever else, there is some, um, what are they called? Dendritic, what the heck are they called? On, on, an, on a neuron, what are those called? Dendritic? Uh, the, uh, the dendrites um, receive the signal and, and the axon. No, no, I, I know that, but I know that. Yeah. But what's the thing? Dendritic trees, I guess they're called. That's a, oh, okay, that's a, yeah. That's a weird name because I'm realizing that dendritic means like a tree, like from dendros in Greek. And so okay. dendritic trees is like saying, it's like saying saying it twice, so to speak. Tree like tree, yes. Right. The, but, but anyway, so I mean, those are cases where there is some spatial information that is might be being used other than this kind of molecular scale sort of string matching type information. Yeah. But okay, the big question as far as I'm concerned is if we are going to, you know, we're going to represent information, we're going to represent computations chemically, what's the right way to do that? In other words, I biology has chosen a particular way of doing it in which it's very big on string matching, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I'm just curious if we, so a question for Bob that I, I think I've asked Bob over at least 25 years, right? It's like, if you're gonna do computation with molecules, what's the right basis collection of molecules to use? You know, what kinds of molecules? Because clearly, you know, clearly one kind of molecules. Okay, the success story is bio is biology. Yeah, which is you know DNA plus proteins for, but, for a very large part. Yep. But so the question is, could one imagine any other class of molecules that maybe don't use as much string matching stuff, but maybe use another form of because string matching is one way to determine what happens in a chemical reaction. It's a very, it's a very combinatorial way to determine what chemical reactions are possible, but one could imagine much coarser ways to determine what chemical reactions are possible. If that makes sense. Yeah. And well, the only thing that comes to mind for collections of molecules to use as your basis set, as it were, are some of the things that have been done since the the late 1990s in terms of combinatorial synthesis. Uh, or modular synthesis, where you have uh, a particular type of reaction, instead of am amide bond forming the way you do in proteins, you uh, form other types of bonds, but in a very modular and repetitive way. And then you have very large collections of reactants that fit in the different slots in that process. And then you can generate, you know, from a small number of reactions, 
very large number of, of compounds uh, for you know drug discovery, for example. That's that's where it has come up. Uh, but it's a very but what are narrow drugs made application. Of? Other, other than other than the biologics that are made of proteins and things, what other sort of I don't know heteropolymer like things are there that have been done for drugs? Uh, just these combinatorial libraries are not really polymeric. Uh, there are, you know, a small number of repeating units, you know, two, three, four, maybe five, where they I do see. all kinds of combinations in those positions. Uh, and what are they typically? What are, what are they chemically? Um, uh, there are various kinds of uh, things you can couple easily. Uh, some of them are amide formations. Uh, I don't remember all of them for sure, but um very relatively simple chemistry that you can get a robot to carry out uh, right. in a very repetitive uh, high yield way so uh, this is this is for combinatorial chemistry and what what is the typical i mean the you know you're generating millions of compounds or more i you could on the order of of, of millions potentially yeah okay. you might you might have 30 or to 50 types of amines and a couple of dozen types of acids and you're combining them together and then there's something else at the next location you know so you multiply that result by 20 or 30 or 50 or 60 or something like that and that okay. tells you the you know but so so the goal here in, in all cases is it fair to say that you know one's using the shapes of molecules as the i mean the ultimate thing you care about is, it, is, it, is that a fair statement or is it how much is how much is shape and charge distribution what you care about and how much is it actual atomic constitution of the of the molecules for drug discovery it's definitely shape and charge distribution and how much of that is you know you can govern that to a degree by what the, the, by the constitution by by what building blocks you use but ultimately there are some interactions among those building blocks uh, that affect the, the overall shape and charge distribution. And then when they, those compounds get to the receptor, there's always the induced fit uh, effect as well but, on top but, of that. But so some, I mean, one might expect that sometimes the drug is a cage that has some weird heavy, you know, heavy ion in it or something. Or has that mm, never happened? I haven't seen that. I mean, people have made those. They've put, you know, potassium ions inside of buckyballs and things like that. Right. Um, and that doesn't matter. And, well, some, some drugs do actually work that way by sequestering uh, metal ions uh, and, and become uh, antibiotics and things like that. Uh, so, are there these sulfur antibiotics, sulfur-based antibiotics? Am I remembering the this? sulfur drugs? No, those those don't do that. I not I don't recall what their mechanism is. But things like valinomycin um, is a depsipeptide. It's a very large ring structure, but it folds up very nicely, uh, providing uh, a, something like eight coordination sites, so it can grab metals nicely. Hmm. And it uses the metals as a, as a, in its antibiotic action or not? Uh, I don't think it's a way of delivering them, but just a way of sequestering them that, that basically kills the, the, the bacteria. Why does that kill the bacteria? I, I don't remember. Okay. All right. Never mind. That's the, we're getting down in. Okay. But the question for us is given that, you know, if we're asking the question, how do we, so, so let's imagine that, okay, my goal is to, generate and now this shows my total lack of knowledge of chemistry you know i want to generate like the a thing i can see in electrophoretic gel that makes the primes let's say or what's the best way okay goal you know generate the primes with molecules sample goal okay how could we imagine doing that What's a, I mean, like, like implement, let me give an example. Implement the sieve of Eratosthenes, which you say, well, that's a big complicated mess, but let me show you an example. I mean, in, in um, uh, let's see if I can find it. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, here's an example. So, you know, let's see, this is one. Um, 
this is needless to say from the NCAS book, of course, this is a cellular automaton that um, uh, implements that, you know, that generates the primes. Okay. So my question is, how can I do that with molecules? Okay, so one way you might do that is by the molecular size, it only generates sizes that correspond to primes. Okay, that's an interesting idea. There's, okay, okay. Uh, another way would be that given one molecule, you do something to it and, you know, given one molecule that represents a prime, you do something to it and it gives you the next prime. And then you do something hopefully the same sort of thing in, in a generic way to the, that molecule, and it gives you the next prime. In other words, All right. you can generate them in a sequence. Okay, let's take the only molecular sizes that are prime. That would be very cool. Let's say we could get some random hydrocarbons, and you, know, you do uh, you know, mass spectrometry, and you find that all the, all the sizes are prime. How mm -hmm. could we imagine generating that? So... I mean, again, this is state-based information. This is, again, using concentration as our storage of information, which may not be the only way to do it, and in fact, may not be the richest. I, am, I suspect it's not the richest way to do it. Um, I wasn't thinking concentration at all. I would be thinking that the, the molecular structure of one prime could be used to encode somehow uh, the starting point to get to the next prime. Well, I understand, but this one generate only molecular size of the prime. So let me give you an example there. E.g., you know, maybe there are only certain buckyballs that can make certain buckyballs. So this is, so this is essentially like a tiling problem. So yeah, yeah tiling that certainly problem. would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So th this is, and that that way, um, and then. Uh, Let's see. I mean, you know, for a crystal, we could easily say, uh, well, I mean, this is the thing I've been searching for for other reasons is, is uh, sort of random crystal type things. Been looking for those for ages. But that's a, I mean, let's take this example of buckyballs, right? Is it, you know, okay, so one set, of, one thing is you set up constraints that only have, that are only satisfied by, by the result you want. Right, so I don't know what the constraints are on buckyballs. Does anybody know? I mean, the, the um, uh, well, so we... you would start with C60, and then uh, there are ways you can expand it. Uh, the structures are ellipsoidal, um, or you can grow a bucky tube that has basically a, a right. hemisphere at each end. But those tubes would definitely be a linear sort of growth. Right, you could so also here... do like cups and moles. A building where if you're building blocks or c5 and c6 rings they don't always seem together to close a ball but you can do the you know half balls or half bowls or yeah and then you could have some kind of penrose tiling mm -hmm. um as well not sure if you could do it with carbon though but it, it, uh, some uh, aluminum alloys do do that Okay, so you're saying we could have, so, so one possibility is that we have tiling rules that give us certain mathematical, certain desirable, I mean, that's a very difficult CAD problem, so to speak. Design the tiling rules <laughs> that give us some output, right? Oh. But that's a, that would be a possible way to do this. And then what we're asking for is that the chemical process in its minimum energy state is, I mean, th this is like, I mean, you know, this is, you know, this is analogous to find the, uh, you know, um, find the ground state of a spin glass, which we know that can, that's mappable onto the traveling salesman problem. But that's, um, uh, I mean, that case is you've got a substrate. I mean, this is a case with a substrate. So remember, um, you know, what we're talking about there is we've got something like an Ising model where we say at every at every node of a of a of a lattice, uh, at every you know point in a in a grid, we have a spin that can be up or down 
and there's an energy function that determines um, the the energy based on the whether the spins near it are that's aligned or anti-aligned. And the question, and, and as you go around that grid, we're changing whether we count the thing as aligned or anti-aligned. That, that is equivalent to a graph theory problem, but that requires a substrate, right? So that's a case where, in a sense, we are specifying our program with the substrate, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I mean, and, and, and for instance, one could imagine, you know, is there a substrate in, in my, you know, is there a substrate uh, so that, is there a substrate that we can make as a metamaterial or something um, so that we get, uh, you know, um, you know, so that we get, e.g., the primes. Look, as an example of this, okay, so here's an example. Um, simpler goal, make the two Morse sequence. So that, that sequence is, if we take a substitution system, um, that sequence is one goes to one zero, uh, zero goes to, am I getting this right? Is that the right thing? I think that's right. And I start off with one and I run it five steps. And yes, I think what I get here is what I get um, um, is a sequence, if I say last of that, that that sequence will be, will have all kinds of random characteristics. That sequence is not, if I say, for example, list line plot, of minus one to the power that, um, uh, oh, wait a minute, is that? No, it's not periodic. It can't be, it, it's never periodic. It just wiggles between, um, between those values, but it's not periodic. But one could imagine doing something, I mean, again, this is something where there's a process and we could imagine following it. But as opposed to, we've got something like this where we're just finding the minimum energy configuration by, I mean, I, I don't know, th these, right. So you're saying, given a set of tiling rules, there will be a certain set of things that could come out. That's one model of, of how you can compute things. But I think it's more, I mean, that's just saying, and the thing will somehow find its minimum energy configuration. But my claim would be, as soon as the computation gets hard, it will just not find a minimum energy configuration. Let me give an example. Yeah, the, it will um, get stuck. It will get stuck, right. So, so I mean, an example of this, uh, okay. Analogous example um, is uh, freezing of um, you know freezing of complicated molecules, right? Where where you can say you know that freezing is you've got to arrange them you know, arrange all these complicated molecules into a crystal, and I don't know what, what I, I I seem to remember that if you look at just uh, you know big long hydrocarbons that you eventually get this kind of, you know, as you try to freeze them, they eventually just become mushy because they don't definitively form a crystal. Is that, is that a true statement? Does anybody know? Pretty much. It would be very hard to get them to be elongated uh, where they could pack nicely into a crystal. Um, so that's a statement of basically computational difficulty. Is there, what, what's the name for yeah. that phenomenon in chemistry? It's what, just, that they don't crystallize? Yeah. Uh, it's amorphous, right? It's an amorphous state. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Jason. Um, but now, if I were to ask the question, if I have a, um, um, you know, let's say, I, I remember I looked at this in the NKS book. I just had some picture of... Um, if I can find it, um, um, oh come now! I thought I had some. Yeah, here we go. This was my my picture of um, the uh, uh, melting points of molecules of different shapes. So my question would be: If I get to the point where, um, 
you know, is there some moment where I can no longer put a, put a definitive point here? And how is that moment characterized? If that makes sense. I mean, if I look up the, the melting point, I mean, if I look, at, let, let's just do it. If I say something like, uh, okay, chemistry help, please give me, give me a, a class of things for which there are isomers that are... The, the hydrocarbons. Yeah, okay. But so what do, what, do, what do I do? I say molecule of... How, how do I get the isomers of... <laughs> Is there an entity class for that, Jason, or do we use chemical data to get those? Let's see. Uh, do you want to get all the molecules with a particular formula? Yeah, let's say well, the, the hydrocarbons, for example. Yeah, all these alkane things with just... With, so, with, so entity list of entity class chemical alkanes should uh, have a decent... No, but I, I want the ones for, like, say, size 8. Ah, so like C8H16? Um, yes, I guess so. Yeah, all of those. Right. So I get all of those uh, the, the entity class chemical, and then um, it can either be a rule or a list of rules, I think. So you then you do um, entity. Let, let me look it up. I believe you, you have to do entity property of chemical Hill formula goes to and then a string um, C, C8 H. Okay. Chemical uh, comma Hill formula. Mm hmm. I wrote a nested program a while back that would generate all of the hydrocarbons of a given size. Yeah, right, but that, got one of those just as a graph, too. right? Okay, hold on. Let, let's. So, what what do I want to do here? I want to say C C eight H sixteen. Right. So that would have a uh, one degree of unsaturation. If you want fully uh, saturated, it would be eight H eighteen. Okay, these pick these ones, and then you yeah. have to do entity list on it. So that would be yeah. is the, the things I've drawn here. Yeah, I believe those, those are saturated. Those I think the yeah, from what I remember from the NKS book goes through the saturated hydrocarbons. The uh, okay. Um okay, but Joseph is saying that he actually has something which which just computes it graph theoretically. I so think I it's actually fairly easy to convert the nest graph function into a traditional nest function. But we can we can generate. I mean, these graphs. What aspect do these? Okay, but anyway, we we can generate these graphs. The thing I was hoping to do was to just look up what we say the melting points of all these things are, and do they all have melting points? What what will we say if the thing becomes amorphous? What do we say for the melting point? Be either uh, be missing, not applicable, if, yeah, uh, not, or not, not available. Not. Most likely, it would be not available. Yeah, I guess it depends on who put it in and when. Yeah, but but some amorphous things do actually melt, but and they would be characterized by a melting point, which is at a uh, okay naive question about thermodynamics, so to speak, right? The thermodynamic limit. Okay, do amorphous materials have definitive melting points, or are they a range of melting points? It so could be. They, uh, some of them do melt, but they melt over a range. Um, some of them may not melt at all and decompose. Right, but okay, but of the ones that, I mean, the thermodynamic limit, the theory of phase transition says, if you have a phase transition, there will be a precise value of temperature at which you get this sort of, uh, you know, change of phase. But for an amorphous material, perhaps that is not the case. Yeah. Okay. So, um, but I, I guess my question here is, you know, okay, so what we're trying to think about is if we are trying to do computation with molecules, sort of plan A would be, like, like for example, in this exercise of, of can we generate alkanes, let's say, with prime number you know, of prime number sizes. Is that completely crazy? Is there any process we can imagine that would do that? Alkanes are uh, particularly difficult. You definitely need a lot of computation on top of that. I just don't see what computation uh, would be available to do that. But I, that doesn't necessarily rule out the possibility. 
Well, but, but I mean, okay, pick something else. I mean, I, I'd be happy to have any kind of um, like polymer, you know, let, let's say, okay, let, let me pick a different example. Okay, let's just put, use this. Um, I, I just do it here. Um, so it was a Hill formula string and that's why it didn't match earlier. Ah, uh, okay. So that gives us, that's kind of cool actually. Wow. That's so. How do I get? Um, how, how would I get the actual molecules to go with these? So you could do um, uh, entity association as the third third argument to entity value there, and then key map molecule if you want. Why is this taking so long? Grumble, grumble, so grumble. It, right, right. Formatting them takes a little bit too. Okay, so that should be a version of this picture up here. So all of these, so then I don't know that, I mean, I know the Wiener index things for boiling points, but I don't think there's an analogous. I think this is a much harder problem, melting points. Um, okay. Just for fun, I mean, we could do, can we, well, okay, so this gives us a sense of this. But if we ask the question, um, what, uh, okay, consider a polymer of some kind. Is there any way we can imagine saying, I want a prime number of polymeric units? I mean, in a sense, okay, the, the, the question is, what is the right raw material for doing something like what we've done here with the cellular automaton? So what we've done here, just to be clear, these are basically things that bounce back and forth, and they bounce back and forth between barriers that are progressively larger in size, thereby basically killing off. And, and any, anytime they bounce, they're basically making all multiples as soon as, as soon as there is a multiple to be made of something, it will make a stripe on this side. So the, the, the gap stripes are the ones where there is no multiple of anything that makes that number, hence a prime. Yep. Okay. So, I mean, just as an example, that would be a, a case, you know, could we imagine? So like, if we can't do that with the actual products, can we do that with the reaction network? That's the question for, for um, um, so for example, to, to give an example, um, you know, something I looked at fairly recently was, if I can find it, um, here we go, multi-way Turing machines, okay? So this is Turing machines where the computer, and I don't really know where the computation, there are many paths, right? So this is an, Ordinary Turing machine just doing its thing. It has a definite evolution. This is a multi-way Turing machine that can have multiple branches of its evolution, right? So the actual deterministic Turing machine goes down one particular branch. Okay, so the question is, this is kind of like our reaction network, if that makes sense. These are multiple branches that it can go down. And these things here are states that could be thought of as, as particular molecules. So then the question is, you know, in this setup where we have this multi-way Turing machine, is there a way in which the result of the computation can be encoded in the structure of this multi-way graph? You know, th this is basically, um, you know, the question is, can there be a computation encoded in the chemical network, basically? And we would use the network as the framework for a computation. Uh, I think the point here is that we would be using um, the the network as um, we'd be saying the answer is this because the network has this structure in the middle. See what I'm saying? So in other words, we're not saying the answer is a particular one of these that is my favorite shaped molecule. We're saying somehow 
and this is the question of whether this is used in molecular biology or not, whether the actual time history of the network could be something that is relevant. Like, like for instance, if you have some cycle in, um, you know, I, again, uh, well, I just, I just don't know. I mean, this is the, okay, my little thing from my post from yesterday was the, the speculation that, you know, the big innovation when people realized that DNA molecules could store information was a single molecule can store information. That was not obvious before DNA, before 1953. But the question is, can relevant information be stored in the time history of molecular interactions? And can that information somehow be accessed by virtue of the fact that when you are in some state here with some particular time history of molecules, it's like the, the lie to the molecular chaos assumption of the Boltzmann equation of, of, well, these molecules aren't actually in completely random states. They have certain orientations and momenta and so on, and which can be, you know, which matter and which are determined by the structure of this thing here. Is that crazy? Uh, I won't comment on crazy, but what, what I'm thinking of here is the closest analogy that I can think of is something like uh, these clock networks um, that that uh, basically give you your you know your internal clock for your circadian rhythm. It's not just the sun rising and setting. Yeah, right. But there are okay, some biochemical so. reactions that take 24 hours, and that's why you know animals living entirely in the dark. Yeah, right. Still have these rhythms. But now, aren't those just slow chemical reactions? Uh, they are slow, but the, uh, there's the feedback in there that lets their concentrations rise and fall periodically. Right. I haven't looked into them in yeah, detail, that's okay. but, but, but that's can, basically what they do. I can provide an example of a uh, cyclical uh, reaction. Yeah, I mean, right. There are many, I mean, I don't know what the... The fastest one, is, a fast one that's often done in a lab as, as a toy experiment is uh, the, the uh, belusov zabotsky -E reaction. I, I can't pronounce it properly. Easy, belusov zabotinsky reaction. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yes. I mean, the, the, those tend to have... So what's interesting about the BZ reaction is that it has, you know, it has a spatial dependence to it, tends to have reaction diffusion type stuff. Mm -hmm. But that's, which is, which is relevant. I mean, that's used in biology, plenty. That's used in all kinds of pigmentation pattern type things and so on. And that, again, has spatial dependence, I guess. Okay. Um, okay. Um, but these, they're, you know, they're, they're, are, several oscillator circuits and they, they are been they've been fairly extensively studied right so this is okay so this is the thing where one is using bz reactions on a plate great yeah that's nice. fine that's that's nice yeah the right well it's like cellular automata exactly like cellular automata um, um, yeah I've just modeled that as differential equations and you, you can see the concentrations, you know, rising and falling periodically. And when a, a certain, you know, when one of the components exceeds a certain amount, the color changes to orange and then, you know, it goes clear. Right. Uh, when it falls below that. Um, let's see, but I'm, I'm still pushing on, um, uh, uh I need to go in a second here, but but um, um, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm just wondering if the prime problem is is too hard to do chemically. If there's something else that we could compute with um, the uh, in your combinator paper, there there was uh, you had an example of you know enumerating the integers. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, you could certainly do that, fun. yeah, I mean, by just, you, you know, making, you know, a longer, longer, longer polymer um, with your process to do right, that. Right, but, but see, but the thing is, what I really want to, the whole point is we need a framework. We need primitives, like combinators, for example, where by, you know, what what is the mechanism by which we think this could work? Basically, what has to happen is, that some external stimulus, I mean, okay, so how do you program 
how do you program the molecules? How do you program the chemical system? So one thing is, uh, you know, put in certain initial conditions. Mm -hmm. That's thing number one. Thing number two is, you know, flash light at it or something. That's what else could you do? You could put magnetic fields. You can heat it. Yeah, cool it. definitely temperature heating, cooling. Um, you can change the pH. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Which is, but now pH is, that's a little bit trickier because pH is, is like adding another compound to the thing. So another, so yes. I, I think another, another category is change pH versus slash add some other, you know, wash it with some other, wash through with, you know, mm -hmm. a catalyst. wash in some other uh, compound. Yeah. And it, it yes. sounds like you're you're thinking of more like a, a bulk reactor, you know, essentially a test tube. And the, another aspect that could be considered is uh, uh, a flow system where you have it flowing through a long, thin tube, and things can be done at different points along the tube. I see. Um, I mean, right. th okay. This is a kind of chemistry that uh, came about after I was out of the lab, so I'm not that familiar with it. Oh, but but you see, but the point about it is, what I'm imagining is that yes, you do that. I mean, basically, what's going to happen is there's a big multi-way graph of all these reactions that are happening, and you are changing the multi-way graph in some way. You're determining you've got a, a basic, you know, structure that's 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 happening here. You know, mm -hmm. in a sense, okay, thinking it uh, physics like, you've got the underlying sort of thing that's knitting together the structure of space. And then these things that you're doing to it, like flashing light at it or whatever else, or washing it through with some acid or something, um, those are things that are like uh, sort of things happening in space, and they cause a perturbation in the multi-way graph. And what you're looking at then is the kind of on that on that substrate of the underlying you know quote structure of space from the multi-way graph. You're asking what effects you know, what you might think. Okay, so you're asking, is there some sort of, yes, yes. What, what is the, um, uh, in a sense, it's like, um, given, given a background multi-way structure, you know, what is the effective physics of making certain perturbations? if you see what I'm saying. So in other words, the idea would be the computation happens by virtue of these perturbations. So computation is through certain persistent, is perhaps is through certain persistent perturbations. I don't know. That's like particles, for example. Uh, um, oh, wow. There's a... Rich is commenting, cicadas make primes. That's a good point. Um, oh, in terms of their reproductive cycle, yes, that's true. Although, does anybody know how? I do not. I think that may be an unknown thing, how that works. I think, it's, I think the belief is that it's slow chemical reactions of various kinds. Uh, probably an oscillator, again, some kind of clock that controls uh, the pupation. Yeah, right. Like a circadian rhythm, but it happens to be seven years long. <laughs> yes. Right. Um, yeah, no, I, I like that example. Cicadas, cicadas and circadian. Cicadas are circadian. That's confusing. Um, the, uh, um, and uh, let's see. There was a comment here. I think this may be by a chap I know. This is about a paper about a biological generator. Oh, wow. Um, that's cool. Oh, yeah, I know Eric Gullis. Um, cool. Okay, how does this work? Oh, it's about cicadas. What do you know? Let's see what they say. Um, and then I need to go to a different meeting. But, but um, uh, Eric Gullis was just joined us for the um, 
discussion we did of distributed consensus, which, by the way, is not completely irrelevant to um, to this question. Okay, so okay, predator fitness. It's got a GCD. Hey, wait a minute. I'm not a believer in that. There ain't no GCDs. The the organisms that create GCDs are few and far between, in my opinion. Um, but that's interesting. I mean, in in uh, uh, okay, I think we have to look at this in more detail. Um, no. But the thing yeah. about the cicadas is, is that uh, they, they only generate, if you want to use the term generate, a few primes. I know. But look, in, in, I mean, these things, look, there are physical processes like ones in the cochlea that, you know, have, uh, you know, we get certain musical things are pleasing because of certain, you know, interference fringes effectively but that's again that's that doesn't sort of doesn't count I mean, mm -hmm. i think um i mean the thing that i'm interested in is you know is there a way to have i think that the the right way to think about this is probably that there's an underlying multi-way graph of some complicated set of chemical reactions and that we have certain perturbations we can make on those chemical reactions and that the working out of those perturbations corresponds to a computation. Would that be restricting to a particular path through the multi-way? No, no, the whole no. idea would be- The graph would change. Make a per perturbation, right. You make a perturbation and okay. the whole difference between the way you think about it normally with chemicals is the effect of the perturbation. Actually, I had never really thought about this as perturbations in multi-way graphs. I mean, that's a good, um, uh, um, you know, so actually, I think I did think about it. I think there's something in it in the, about it in the um, in the physics um, project uh, technical background document that I wrote. Um, um, but that's that will be the thing that the perturbation in the multi-way graph. You know, in other words, the the underlying structure of all these reactions and so on, in a sense, is like the knitting together of space in physics. And then the perturbations are where the kind of interesting action is. Um, and that's um, um, the, uh, um, yeah, I actually like that idea. And I think that's what we see, you know, in a, in a random cellular automaton, for example, um, you know, we're seeing computation happen by virtue of certain, for example, topologically stable objects interacting. So the question is, is there, are there um, topologically stable structures in multi-way graphs? And I bet the answer is yes. Um, and by the way, uh, just to not be too exotic, but I suspect that's related to bizarre phenomena in multi-body multi quantum mechanics. Because in a sense, what's happening is, you know, quantum mechanics is a story of the branchial structure of the sort of the, the entanglement of things on a particular slice of one of these graphs. And so by saying that there is a topologically stable structure, one saying that in branchial space, there's a topologically stable structure, which is actually something I've not thought about properly. That's the possibility of essentially particles in branchial space. Um, the, uh, I mean, there are particles in physical space, but what do particles look like in branchial space? In other words, what, um, uh, Boy, that's an interesting idea. Okay. Um, uh, okay, Richard is commenting, a hypergraph rewrite rule that results in a continuous dynamical system whose solution is the two Morse constant. Yes. I mean, I found a bunch of hypergraph rewrite rules where the count of the number of states generated is a Fibonacci number or something like this. By the way, Fibonacci is definitely easier than primes. I just decided to pick something hard. <laughs> um, the, um, all right, we have to wrap up, unfortunately. Yeah. But someone was commenting that, um, are we watching the invention of the chemical computer in real time? Well, maybe. The, um, these chemical computers are trying to create, uh, I, th there's definitely something to find here. I mean, this is, there's, there's a kind of a, I think there's a way of thinking about sort of, computation in chemical space, which is effectively what this is, as opposed to computation in, in well, it isn't really even in chemical space, it's in, it's in chemical history space, as opposed to just in concentration space. Anyway, I need to go. Um, but uh, 
thanks for coming guys and um uh thanks for joining us on the live stream some good suggestions much appreciated and uh, we will continue another time all right bye for now